Well, let's see. It's uh, it's, it's nine oh one. I suppose we should probably begin. Yes. Okay. Let me uh, share the screen here. Good morning, good evening, or wherever you are in the galaxy. <laughs> Welcome to the 2021 uh, Planning Committee meeting of the Millennium Project. Uh, the virus is still going on, so we're not face-to-face in -face anymore, unfortunately, but hopefully next year we will be. Uh, we'll begin with, a, I'll give, begin with a slight overview of some of our updates and accomplishments and a few words about the United Nations uh, Common Agenda, Real-Time Delphi. This is a big, big thing coming up potentially for us. And then Elizabeth to talk so, uh, some about uh, the updating the State of the Future Index, which hadn't been updated for a while. So this is, this is gonna be good uh, input for the next State of the Future report. And then uh, each of the node reports uh, and uh, Jose is gonna run interference and try it to do it as diplomatically as possible. But for those who run too long, he's going to push. And then we'll have an open discussion about next steps, what we'd like to do uh, for the coming year. So- Jerry, the, you must have the YouTube with volume on because we, li we listen to the echo. You have to mute your YouTube or close your YouTube. I don't have YouTube on. I'm not hearing any echo. I'll say you're the only one hearing the echo. Well, wait a minute. I can't tell what's going on here. Um, well, now I've just clicked myself. Okay, so everybody else is okay. Shall I continue? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So I hope you like this cover. Uh, Elizabeth and I have talked a little bit about the idea of a guy or a group of scientists who figured out how to um, curve space. Uh, we'll talk about that maybe later on in the open discussion. And it's a great photograph of this. So the idea mm -hmm. of, of the, of us, you know, yeah. faster than light travel, so to speak, the, the curving the, 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 the fabric of the universe looks like this may be possible. But anyway, that's an, we'll put that photograph somewhere. But so far, this is the cover. I hope you like it. Uh, it's a gorgeous cover, I think. And so we'll have the normal executive summary, the 15 global challenges, the state of the future index, which we'll be working on soon. Uh, the global developments, by the way, there are a lot of stuff that came through on the global developments. That's the one we did with uh, in cooperation with uh, Ernst & Young. It is so rich. I mean, I, I'm distilled just the first part of the first question, distilled it, the basics down to 12 pages. So it is murder amount of stuff in there. So we'll work on that. Uh, then we'll, uh, there'll be a section on the artificial general intelligence. That issue is, is warming up around the world. Uh, and then the UN Office of Strategic <laughs> Threats, how we did on that, World Future Day, and then the COVID scenarios and reflections. Um, the COVID scenarios uh, were pretty well received around, around as mentioned before, translated in, in Korean and also Spanish and also in, in Chinese. Um, the real-time Delphi and global developments uh, completed that. Uh, the new nodes, Denmark, uh, we'll get a video from the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies. That's one of the oldest think tanks in Europe, by the way. Very happy to have them. Uh, and Nepal just also joined. Uh, it's in the, uh, Nepalese, I should say Nepal. I've, I've been calling it Nepal all these years, but I'm told it's pronounced Nepal. Nepal uh, Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. Uh, this makes now 70 nodes. Granted, not all nodes are as active as some of the ones here, but 70 at this point. There was, uh, you remember some years ago, we did a self-evaluation, thought we would sort of clean up the house a bit. But the chairman at the time, Ambassador McDonald, no longer with us, said, that's all right. You never know. They may come back in. So don't you know, fire people as such. Anyway, we have a le the letter to the UN Secretary General signed by over 200 thought leaders. This was very, very good project. Um, it did get the Secretary General's office. The Secretary General did read it. And he did say, OK, and turned it over to the head of strategy for the UN office, the Secretary General's office. And that's who we're collaborating with on our common agenda. And we'll talk more about the common agenda in a bit. World Futures Day, the 8th. Hey, amazingly enough, um, we can talk. Uh, Mara did some nice uh, work on that. And so we can share that later on. Uh, there is some 
discussion going back and forth about the UAE's World Future Day on December 2nd. And that'll sort of sort, sort of self out over, I suspect, the next few uh, few months. Um, they didn't do one much at all uh, this December 2nd. They really weren't ready for it. But then they'll start uh, apparently the next one. And they've agreed that they'll be in cooperation with us. And Paul Sappho, the new board member. Paul, take a bow there. <laughs> He doesn't know what he's gotten into, but he's beginning to realize it. <laughs> all right, communications director Mara. Thank you, Mara, for all your great work you've been doing. This is fabulous. Not only with this, this particular meeting, but she's sort of reactivated our social media and getting a lot of our stuff out there. I hope you're, everybody's seeing that better communication. And if you do an article, this, you know, not just your normal article, but an article that includes some of the Millennium Project research or something about that, you know, send it to her because we're going to put it on online and, and share it with the rest of the world. And uh, we've had over 14, we've had 14 interns uh, this past year, five from China, all tele-interns except one from Korea. And then we had two from the United States, uh, one each from Brazil, Canada, Germany, Mexico, Netherlands, South Korea, and the UK. Now, I would suggest for those of you uh, who would like, since tele-interns make it a little easier for you to have, uh, but the requirement we have is that you make the decision on who the intern is if they want to intern with your note. That's your decision. Secondly, they have to be able to work in your language so that you can't take the internship with you to learn how to speak Russian. They got to be fluent in Russian before they go before they become accepted by the note. Okay, now this is a big deal. Um, our common agenda is the most future-oriented statement of United Nations reorganization that's been issued by the Secretary General's office himself that has ever been produced in my, my 25 years of UN relations stuff. And we gotta get out there and support it in my judgment, because if this report becomes like one other report, we will have missed an incredible opportunity. Not only is the report future oriented, I mean, you can do a Google you know, not to Google, but you can do a search inside the document and you'll see that the, the foresight is mentioned, I don't know, 13, 20 times throughout the document, which is really different than anything <laughs> the UN's produced that I've seen. Anyway, the second part that's important for you to know is the Secretary General, Guterres, when he was Prime Minister of Portugal, set up his own foresight unit. So you don't need to explain to this guy, hey, this is important to do. He's got it. What he needs is support. Because if the member nations don't sort of get in there and say, let's get with it, then it's, it's all pointless. So this is a, a once in, a, in our lifetime opportunity with the UN, I think. Um, now take, a, they got there's, there's, there's six elements that I've pulled out. We'll do a Delphi with this uh, coming up. The first element is a heck of a big deal. As you may know, the UN has five major elements. It's got the secretary, secretariat, of course. It's got the General Assembly. It's got the Security Council. It's got ECOSOC. And it has the UN Trusteeship Council. What is that? That was a big deal after World War II. You had a lot of countries that were former colonies transferring to become independent. Well, the UN helped that transition. It was a very important part of the UN, critical. Now there's not much to do. So the idea is to change this into a foresight body. Could you imagine one fifth of the UN being a foresight body? That's incredible. I mean, let that sink in. I mean, UN talk, like ECOSOC, we talk about that, right? With Economic Social Council, Security Council, you know, military relations and wars and all that. You know, but one fifth could be foresight. Secondly, is not only foresight is a suggestion, it's a multi-stakeholder body. It's not just nation states, which means the Millennium Project could be a member in this council in equal footing with a nation state and other think tanks. I mean, I don't know how this is gonna turn out. And that's one of the reasons why they're letting us do a real-time Delphi to figure out what this thing should be. This is really important. And all of you should, should bring to the attention of your foreign ministry, this document and say, hey, you support it and you are prepared to work with your own country to support that activity. You know, you should be a special advisor to your Ministry of Foreign Affairs on our common agenda. The second, UN Summit on the Future. 
you know, we've had a UN summit on climate change and all kinds of things, but this will be on the future in general to be determined what that's going to be. Futures Lab, also, they, in my view, that it was sort of put in and it's not clear what that will be. So our real-time Delphi can help define what that might be. High-level advisory board led by former heads of states. Uh, we'll see how much foresight that will be, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a function there for it. Special envoy for future generations. This is something that I've heard us talk about you know, in the futures community for many years. Well, okay, let's define it. Let's help support it. You got it in paper now in the UN rather than just a few speeches we give around the world. Six, strategic foresight and global risk report. Now they had an original document of five years. I threw in two to five years because five years, I think is, is, is too much time in between the two of them. Um, which includes, by the way, what we've been pushing for. Because remember, we've been pushing for the idea of strategic trust, I mean, strategic threats assessment and research since March, since March 1st, since the uh, World Future Day meeting. Well, it's in the document. You can, you can read it in the document. You can do a search under existential threats or strategic threats, and you'll, you'll see it's in there. How that gets done, because we were talking about doing a feasibility study, well, okay, so that's now in the process, uh, we're, with, with, which, which we're involved in with, with the real-time Delphi coming up. Okay, so there's a report on the, uh, on the disease. Um, unfortunately, uh, our mixed scenario, baseline scenario did say there's gonna be a bunch of mutations coming up and, it may, and, and that, that, that we may have to have new vaccines. And unfortunately, that's where we are. Uh, it, it, a point of methodology here, I, I would like everybody to appreciate Generally, a lot of futurists will say, what are the two big uncertainties for your country or your corporation or whatever, right? And you say, this uncertainty this way and this way, and this uncertainty this way and this way, then you make a little four by, you know, four cells, two by two grid. Well, there was like around 30 uncertainties. When we wrote this, it was just the beginning before the second wave hit. It was, it was it, 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 we didn't have no vaccines yet. Uh, Trump was still president. I mean, it was a completely different world when we wrote this thing. So we had a lot of uncertainties. So what we did is we had a long list uh, of uncertainties and then say, okay, if it goes in a good way, what does it look like? If it goes in a bad way, what does it look like? And if it's mixed in the middle, what does it look like? So that gave us a characteristics matrix in which we made the, the three scenarios. It's a very simple way to organize something that's really complex, uh, which this, this was at the early point. Uh, each describes how the pandemic may evolve. It's, it's not an endpoint discussion like a lot of the scenario planners do. It's, it's a, you know, how you got there. That's the important part. Uh, input from over 250 medical doctors, public health officials, emergency relief staff, economists, and futurists. Uh, and it provided a coherent picture because during that time we wrote this, the news was giving you a piece of information here, a piece of information there. It was just a chaotic, thing people were very confused about. So we brought it together and we get equal time to different elements such as the economics, the social well-being, the public health, as well as the disease and the medical stuff. Each is about 10 pages of detail. Part of the idea was for people to read this and say, mm, uh, I got to prepare for that. I didn't think about that part. Useful for planning and public understanding. Public understanding, we did some uh, radio shows and things like that about this. Uh, but the idea was to try to give a sense of coherence so that people sort of understood the whole picture and the, the whole bad picture, the whole good picture, and the whole mixed picture, so to speak. And it was distributed by Dr. Fauci's uh, chief of staff through the NIH uh, email list. So we got out to the decision-making, relevant decision-making system. And as I mentioned, translated into Chinese, Korean, Israeli, by the way, but not the whole story, but the summary of it and the Spanish speaking countries. Um, one of the things, uh, the reason you keep hearing me stressing a, a story between the present and the future, how you got there with cause and effect links, is that's how you find out what you don't know that you should know, but you didn't know that you didn't know. For example, when I was writing it about contact tracing, I said, oh, how many contact tracings do we need? So I found out. And then I thought, how many do we have? And I found out a big gap, how are we gonna close the gap? Because you can't write a scenario. See, we're not talking the truth about a scenario, we're talking about plausibility. So I can't talk about contact tracing if the numbers don't add up. 
it's not a plausible scenario in that way. So what I did is I figured out where the extra people could come from, and it was partly the military, but also the Peace Corps. So I called up the Peace Corps and said, hey, would you guys have some volunteers, return volunteers? They had 7,000 came back from overseas because of the pandemic, put them to work. Other volunteers, did they all come back? Can they do it? And they did. And Fauci even sent a video, made a video of this and saying, thank you, Peace Corps. So there's an example where we didn't know that we didn't know there was enough people to do contact tracing. Well, when, then you get to a point of not knowing, stop writing, do research, then come back to it. Okay, enough said on that. Um, and this is the, sort of the way that we, when I say holistic, I mean, we looked at economics as much as the medical, as well as the social well being and so forth. So it was a coherent uh, picture rather than just the vaccines may not lead to herd immunity, which turned out to be the case. We're not there yet. We got the vaccine for a while. Uh, mutations will continue, which turned out to be the case, especially uh, in developing countries where they're not able to have a lot of running water to wash the hands. They don't have the, the protective equipment in the hospitals and they can't social distance because you're crowded into small houses. Virus may have greater economic and social well-being impacts than public health, which we are now experiencing. We need a global pandemic new deal led by the G7, which is beginning to happen, I'm happy to say. New US leadership, happy to say, and COVAX vaccine distribution, which is beginning. Some debt forgiveness, some suspension of debt service payments and other debt negotiation to free funds to fight COVID. Because if, if we don't fight it in the poorer countries, then the mutations just keep coming back just keep coming back. Uh, we will have to learn to live with this like AIDS and Spanish flu. As some of you don't know that the Spanish flu of World War I is what we experience today as the flu. It's just more manageable today. And that may be our future with this. Red Cross uh, gave us this nice little quote. These scenarios are the best integration of medical health, social, economic, and psychological factors of the possible future courses of the COVID pandemic we had. One of the things that became clear in this, and I think that some of us are already stressing around the world is this is giving us a time out. You know, much of what futurists do around the world is telling people, hey, take time out, think, what are the alternative futures you want? Well, now a virus has forced us to think. Uh, you know, for those of you who have children or had children, uh, you know, when they get to be too obnoxious, too noisy, you say, stop, time out, sit down, think about what you did wrong. Well, civilization is going through that right now. Uh, and, 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 and like after World War II, a great disaster, we had a time out to rethink and out came multilateralism. You know, there wasn't much multilateralism before World War II. You know, collaboration of countries cooperating that's, that's, that's a relatively new thing in history. What may come out of this one? A, a better planetary consciousness? Don't know. But I think that we futures should be thinking about what are the alternative futures that come out of this pandemic, just like things came out of other disasters. You know, in nature, this new growth happens all the time after disasters. Okay, next. Uh, we'll talk about next things after the uh, node reports. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to stop sharing.